All right, Jessica Harris, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, so, you know, you actually have been on this program before, but it's been a long time ago. It was back in June of 2016 that we aired a conversation uh, with the title of Can Women Struggle with Porn Too? And so if any of our listeners or viewers want to go back and listen to that podcast, just go to YouTube and search for Can Women Struggle with Porn Too? Jessica Harris, and it'll be the first one that pops up. But uh, it's funny because when when we first got on the line here, um, you kind of gave me this blank stare when I said, hey, it's good to have you back. And and you were kind of wondering, have I been on this program before? But seven years is a long time, right? <laughs> it's a long time. A lot can change in seven years. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Now, we are going to talk about this, your latest book uh, entitled Quenched with the subtitle mm-hmm. of Discovering God's Abundant Grace for Women Struggling with Pornography and Sexual Shame. Uh, But before we get into some of the specifics that you've got in there, can you just give our listeners a little bit of your backstory? Like, how did you get into the space? How did you end up writing a book with that title and subtitle? Can you just give us a little bit of who you are? Yeah, sure. Um, So I write about the topic because it's part of my story. So I am a a woman, obviously, who struggled with pornography and... Um, I grew up in the church (laughs) and it was not talked about in the church at all, really. In my church, it wasn't talked about men or women. Um, But when I went to try to find help as a teenager, I realized all the help out there is for men. There's nothing out there for women. What does that mean for me? Does that mean that there's something wrong with me? Um, And so that kind of began this journey into shame of thinking, wow, I thought this was normal at first. To, to be struggling with this or to be viewing it at least as a woman. I thought like, obviously other people would do this. Why else would it be on the internet? Um, and then when I realized, oh, maybe other women don't do this, there was this feeling of what have I gotten myself into? Am I the only woman in the world who's done this? And so it began this journey of shame that God so graciously rescued me out of. And I was able to find freedom. Um, and I I actually wrote my memoir in 2016, which is probably when we talked the first time. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But my first book, Beggar's Daughter, is like my story written out. And I really just felt like God was telling me to share my story. I did not want to. (laughs) I was like, no, thank you. I would rather just have a normal life and not have this be the thing that people know me for, please. (laughs) Um, But that's not what he had intended. And so I started my blog in 2009, started writing to Christian women who struggle with this. And so then here we are 14 years later and um, finally able to have a a traditionally published book and quenched is a message near and dear to my heart. If there's one book I could write, if I had one shot, uh, this Mm -hmm. is definitely the book that I would want to write. And it's a book I'm proud of. Yeah. And obviously this is a, this is the book that you're you're writing to draw other women into this space of like hope and freedom. Right. So if, if uh, you know, they always say that we need to start at the starting place. So where do you start when you are trying to help another woman who is struggling with these, uh, these issues with pornography, other kinds of sexual sins, where do you start in order to try to help her take the steps towards freedom? Yeah, absolutely. I think the first thing you do is try to help repair the the connection that she has to God. And that's really the heart of Quenched. I had a lot of women writing to me and saying, I can't even open my Bible. I can't even pray right now because I think God's just disgusted with me. He thinks I'm horrible. Like He wants nothing to do with me. And it was, it was heartbreaking for me because here are these women and shame has driven them away from their source of freedom (laughs) and their source of hope. And so if um, you're helping a woman who has this struggle, you get a chance to be an accurate reflection of the heart of God to her in that moment. And you have a choice kind of, you can either be the voice of grace or the voice of shame in her life. And the voice of grace draws us into relationship and draws us into reconciliation and calls us 
to healing and to wholeness, whereas the voice of shame drives us further into isolation and severs relationships and pushes us into hiding. And so if you're helping a woman, I think the very first thing you can do is be that reflection of God's grace for her and help her understand before we talk about any kind of tricks and tips and before we dive into anything else, the first thing you need to know is this is what God thinks about you. And he's not expecting you to get this all figured out on your own and then come to him later. Like he wants to help you with this. He wants to walk through this with you and you as a person who's helping that woman get to be that voice and be that encouragement. And I, I like it's one of the my favorite things about what I do is just getting to tell women that's not that's not what God thinks about you. That's not what he wants for you. Like he wants your freedom. He he fought for it. He died for it. So like this he wants you free. He doesn't want you to figure it out first and then get your act together and come back to him. Like he's he's welcoming you in or he's he's asking for an invitation into the fight with you so that he can help you fight this. He's not pushing you away in disgust and and disowning you. That's not the voice of God at all. Yeah, you know, one of the things I found interesting in your book was as I was going through it, I thought, hey, you know what? This is not uh, strictly for women. <laughs> now, I know that you wrote it for women, but the reality is, is some of the, the things you're touching on, the principles, where you're going in terms of talking about desire, I'm like, these are universal human principles that matter. Now you've got, obviously you brought kind of the female flavor to it in terms of how this really does apply you know, to women. But man, I love the fact that you are attacking things at ground level, that you're not coming from just a behavior modification or whatever. You're saying we've got to talk uh, towards the heart. So can you talk a little bit about why it was so important that you brought up this whole issue of desires as it pertains to what you wrote in this book? Right. Because I think we, when you're a woman who struggles with this, and sometimes in the narratives that we have to talk about sex and sexuality and struggles, we can kind of demonize desire, right? And we like make it like desire is the bad thing. And it's not. What happens is we are given these God honoring and good desires, and then we are given alternatives to satisfy them. And so it's not the desire itself that is wrong, like a desire for sex, for instance, is not what is wrong. And that's not the enemy. But I think so many times when we're trying to fight our way out of these things or find freedom, we target that and we say like, this desire is what's wrong. And if I could just uproot that whole desire and just rip it out of me, like how many times in my own journey did I just say like, God, if you would just take this whole desire away from me, like I wouldn't have this problem anymore. Like, why aren't you fixing me? And the answer is it's because the desire is not the problem. <laughs> like it's, it's how I'm choosing to satisfy it. And it's how I have wired my body to want to satisfy it. And so it's, I wanted to show that for these desires that we have, God wants to meet us in them. He wants to fill them with himself. He's not planning on eradicating them from our lives. Like to live a life with no desire for love and no desire for connection and no desire for worship. No, None of these good and healthy desires would be a, a very sad life indeed. And so I wanted to show that that's not the the problem and God's not appalled by the desires that he gave us. He he wants to meet us there and he wants to fulfill them for us. And that's that's what I want to talk about is the these specific desires that you highlighted in the book. I'd like to go through each one and if you can essentially answer the question for each one of like one what is that desire? Like how do you define it? And then how does that actually apply to a woman who is saying <laughs> I really want to just get off porn I, or I just don't want to be doing these things, these unwanted sexual behaviors. So when we look at the first one, you say there's a desire to be known. So can you help define that? And then how does that apply to a woman who wants to get away from these mm -hmm. unwanted desires? Yeah. So the desire to be known, I feel like any of us, like 
if you look around you, you can see it. Like we just want to be authentic. We don't want to to be fake. And you can see it a lot in culture of like this idea of like, I want to belong. I want to be with people who know me for who I am and who accept me for who I am. And so I have this desire to just be known and not have to be fake and filtered um, and to be loved. Even when you're talking about like a, a baby, like I have two kids now. And um, <clears throat> even from the beginning, they just want to, to have their people, right? They want their community and their, their people. So we have this desire to just be authentic and real with other people and not have to pretend and to be fake. The problem with or how pornography tries to fill that or how it interferes with that is it encourages a, a falseness. It encourages or even how shame can interfere. It encourages a hiding. And so this desire to be known is now attacked essentially by shame where I say like, it is now dangerous to be known. I cannot be known. And then pornography can rewire what that looks like. What does it look like to be known? Oh, well, that intimacy that's supposed to exist in the sexual union is gone. And now sex is just about like the physical joining of two bodies. And it's not about, about me being known. It's not about a relationship. And so pornography is like, taking over that desire and telling me that it really doesn't matter. Like It does not matter what your favorite color is, what your favorite food is. We don't care. What we care about is what can you do in bed or like, how are you going to meet this need for someone else? Like there is, it robs you almost of that ability to be known. So um, I think like shame and pornography team up for a lot of these and kind of rewire them and hijack them. Yeah, it sounds like, uh, and and maybe this is also a thread that kind of goes through all of these. It sounds like, especially on this one to be known, that it's such a direct attack on your identity, right? The, the, the sense of being made in God's image and we're made for relationship. Um, and uh, the next one that you mentioned is that we've got a desire to be free. So describe that or define that. And then this can feel almost like one that's kind of hitting the nose, like, well, of course I want to be free. But what does that actually look like? What does that actually mean? And how does this one apply to someone who wants to break free? Mm -hmm. So I think all of us can understand like we don't want to be controlled by something, right? Like none of us like to be under the control of something, if you will. We all long for freedom and long for the ability to make our own choices. I mean, ever since we're like three, my daughter's three years old, you know, she wants her freedom and her ability to make her own choices. And so we want freedom. The problem with that, not the problem with that desire, but when we're looking for freedom, what can happen is we can say, well, I want the freedom to keep doing what I'm doing without anyone telling me that it's wrong. And we think that's what freedom is. Freedom to me is I'm going to continue doing what I've always been doing and you can't tell me that I'm wrong. <clears throat> we want the freedom to continue making the wrong choice. And what that can do is it can drive us into this, this false freedom, really, a freedom that's driven by shame and by an errant desire where now we're not living the abundant life that Christ has promised us because he's promised us an abundant life of freedom. Instead, we are living this life of isolation because we have bought the the version of freedom that shame is selling us. That's saying, you don't need these people who are telling you that what you're doing is wrong. You don't need these people who are judging you. Freedom looks like getting away from them. So freedom looks like being able to watch pornography whenever I want to and cutting off my church because they're judging me for it. Freedom looks like cutting off relationships that I feel like are judgmental and attacking me. And then what's the end result? I'm free to do whatever I want, but I'm alone, right? Like I'm, I'm free to do whatever I want. It's, and I'm not making the right choice, but now I'm alone, unknown, empty, not healed, not whole. And I've, I've cut myself off from all of the meaningful relationships in my life. So they kind of piggyback on each other, that desire to be known is so important 
But then when we're trying to find freedom, we can settle for that false freedom of, well, I would rather give up being known in order to maintain my right to do whatever I want. And that's not the freedom that Christ is offering us. That's not the freedom that he's calling us to. In Quenched, I talk about um, the narrative of John 4 and the woman at the well. And she, Jesus obviously offers his living water, right? Everyone knows who's grown up in church, has heard the story, knows it. <clears throat> and he says, whoever drinks this water will not thirst again. And he says that twice. So his promise of the living water is that it'll quench your thirst. And she responds, give me this water so that I won't thirst and so that I won't have to come here anymore. And I just imagine her thinking like it's indoor plumbing, right? Like give it to me straight to where I am. Like give me the living water right to my house. Let me stay stuck right where I am, but let me be able to be fulfilled there. And that's not what God wants for us. Um, he wants to call us out of it and into freedom and into community and community and freedom go together, right? Like we are able to live free and connected with other people and had that desire satisfied that way. Yeah, it's almost like there's this great paradox in God's kingdom when it comes to freedom that we are more free the more we have um, voluntarily put ourselves into the constraints that God has placed on us, where he's drawn the lines, right, in terms of where he says, this is good and this is not good. And so the, it's almost like you're saying, hey, the more we will voluntarily come within those constraints and be responsible, there's a sense in which, my goodness, your freedom is going to flourish because you can be known and you can be honest and you can mm -hmm. be in community. So I love that. You know, this next one is so common. And what I mean by that is the verbiage is so common that I say, think I sometimes, sometimes we miss the magnificence and the beauty of it. And you, you talk about the desire to be loved. Now, unpack that for us, because that word gets thrown around for everything. How do you define this? And how does this apply <laughs> for a woman who's saying, I want to be free from, you know, the, the bondage of sexual sin and pornography? Yeah, so I had a college professor who used to say, um, you don't love chicken patties like <laughs> and, and he was just trying to get us to like understand how overused like the word love truly is like I love chocolate I love my husband I love Tuesdays I love you know? <laughs> and we kind of lose the whole sense of it. it just kind of starts to mean that's my favorite you know and it doesn't mean anything about like being cherished and being cared for and having that sense of safety and security and belonging. Um, <clears throat> and we, again, it's another one. I think that we're, we're, we're born with these, right? So we're born with this need for loving connection and attachment. And we are born needing that nurturing and that care um, we're not like some other animals where it's like, you're here and now you're on your own kid. Like mm -hmm. we, we need that love and that nurturing and that care. And we don't stop needing that as we grow up, you know, we don't outgrow our need to be loved and to be cared for. And the problem is there's a world of false loves out there. I don't just mean like chicken nuggets. Like, I mean, there's a world of love that settles for a love that looks a lot more like abuse, right? Mm -hmm. And we, well, I mean, there was a big thing a few years ago on social media of the girl who, a young woman who said, if your boyfriend's not hitting you, then he doesn't love you. And like, we have mm -hmm. these twisted views of love where it's no longer sacrificial, it's self-serving, where it's no longer intimate, it is just superficial, where it has no depth, to it at all. It's just, you're my favorite for now, but tomorrow there might be a new favorite. And then, you know, you're not my favorite anymore. And there's no commitment to it where what we long for is, are you going to stick with me? Am I safe with you? Am I secure with you? Would you give everything for me? And for women, it's tricky because we get sucked into the romance novels too, right? Like I never struggled with those, but a lot of women do like romance novels are their gateways. And it's this, this super romantic 
love, like I would die for you, you know, I would move heaven and earth for you. But then at the same time, like in our real lives, we're settling for these loves that are false and that are mm. are fake. Um, and a lot of times it's because we come from broken loves, right? I come from a, my dad was abusive and he left our family. So I have a background of having broken love. And that kind of sent me on a search of what does it look like to be loved? And when you find that answer in pornography, that's dangerous because pornography is not a reflection of love in any way, shape or form. There's, there's violence. It's self-serving. You're using other people for your own personal benefit. Like there's nothing loving about it, but we've so mixed, I think, sex and love and kind of made them equivalent to the point that when you look at pornography and go, these people are having sex, this is what love looks like. No, it's not, mm. right? Like there's mm-hmm. God's love for you is what love is supposed to look like. And it's not supposed to be a casual, flippant thing. You are worth far more than that. And so being able to, to reframe our understanding of love and make God's love for us the standard. And this is this is the definition. This is what it looks like to love somebody. It looks like pursuing them, right? God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. Like it looks like pursuing them, even when they are not meeting your standards, even when they are doing something completely in opposition to what you would want for them to do, to still love them and to still sacrifice for them. So I think when we look at what pornography would try to say, this is what love looks like, or the ideal version of love doesn't exist. And this is what you have to settle for. We can combat that lie with the truth of God's love for us. Mm -hmm. How hard is it sometimes for women who have been entangled in the false narrative of love and the false equating of sex equaling love? How hard is it sometimes then to number one, understand the love of God is expressed through the gospel and then actually be able to receive that. Cause I would imagine there's a lot of obstacles there, right? If you've had the false narrative. Oh yeah. There's a lot. <laughs> I feel like this is something that I'm still working through. Like how do I live beloved, right? Mm-hmm. Like how do I understand the depth of God's love for me and what that really means, especially when you come from backgrounds like mine that are abusive and there's abuse and abandonment, you kind of don't know if God's going to do the same thing to you. Right. And it's, it's hard to convince yourself of the truth of who God is because you don't have an example of that in real life. Um, I'm married now. I got married a couple years after our last podcast Mm -hmm. and, uh, (laughs) For the first couple years of our marriage, there were times where it was like, I would look at my husband even, are, are you going to leave? And he's like, of course mm-hmm. not. Like, of course I'm not going to leave. You know, like, Why would you even ask that? But it, you, you, I ask because it's part of my history. And so I think for women, there just needs to be this understanding that it's okay if it's hard for you to understand God's love and to to apply it to your life, especially when you have this background of brokenness in that area. And that is just something that God has to get in there and prove himself again and again. And you have to allow there to be healing there, but I can't say that that's easy. And I think that there are still days where I struggle with understanding that I'm beloved and Mm. it doesn't matter what, how I've mothered today or what kind of wife I've been today that I've I'm beloved. Um, But when you come from that background where it's broken or when you've spent so long in pornography where it's all dependent on your performance and it's all performance and pornography is so disposable, right? It's so clickable, like close out of that one. I didn't like that person's face moving on. Mm. When you realize that God's love is so different and it's so permanent and it's so intimate and it's so personal and he's not going anywhere, that can be a, quite a journey and quite a struggle because it's different from any relationship that you've experienced. And so it is just letting God prove himself again and again to you. And I think being honest about how you're feeling like, God, I don't understand how you could possibly love me right now. Like I've, 
I've fallen again. That's the big one. You know, women who are trying yeah. to break free. Oh, I've like, I've fallen again. Like there's, are you going to give up on me? You know, are you, are you going to leave and be willing to ask him those questions and let him speak into those places and, and prove himself to you in those places and prove his love to you in those, in those places. Yeah. I don't think that journey scares God in any way, shape or form. I think the whole gospel is him, you know, proving his love to us. And so I don't, I don't think that frightens him for us to say like, this is hard for me to grasp given the history that I have. I think that makes sense. Yeah. And, you know, I think that desire for love flows into this next desire that you have in the book. And I was so glad that you put this in because I don't think this gets talked enough about in the realm of dealing with sexual brokenness and recovery and things like that. But the desire to worship, can you define that for us mm -hmm. and just how vital that is to this whole journey that you're talking about? Right. So... In John 4, when Jesus offers the woman the living water, and she asks for it. He says, go get your husband. And he reveals, like, this is where the big reveal happens, where it's like, oh, she doesn't have a husband. And then she's living with somebody who's not her husband. And she's had five husbands. And this is where the reveal happens. And her very next question is a question about worship. And I thought... I just feel like that's so telling in that because it's not, I feel like my very next question would be, how on earth did you know that? <laughs> like that, right, that yeah. would be my next question. <laughs> but her next question is kind of like, hey, you seem to be a guy who knows a lot of things. And so like, let's talk about worship, you know, like let's, let's talk about this. And I just thought that is so interesting to me because we do all, there's, there's, songs and sayings about like, we're all worshiping something, right? We're worshiping ourselves, we're worshiping God, we're worshiping sex, we're worship whatever. We all are worshiping, we're giving our devotion to something. So like the desire to be loved is the desire to like have someone love me, but like worship is my pouring of my love and affection on something else. And so we have this longing for worship. In this specific context, I wanted to apply it to Christian women, because I think there are a lot of Christian women out there who think God just thinks I'm a hypocrite for going to church on Sunday morning. And like, I can't go to church on Sunday morning after I've watched pornography because that's just, you know, God wants something to do with me. And we kind of put ourselves in this weird timeout <laughs> of like, well, I fell to pornography. And so now I need to be in timeout for a day and I can't worship God? Like, how can I love Jesus and still struggle with this? There's so many questions that revolve around worship and this feeling of God wouldn't want me to worship him when I'm living life like this. And there's no way I can love Jesus and also have this struggle. And I felt like this story in John 4 is the story of a religious woman who is struggling and when she brings up the question of worship, Jesus's response to her isn't like, hey, stop changing the subject. Let's go back and talk about the husband thing. Or or he doesn't say to her, you should be one. Like, you can't talk about worship. Don't you even dare ask questions about worship, you floozy. Like, he's not talking to her like that. He he answers her question. You know, and then he goes even further in the next part of the dialogue to reveal that he is the Messiah that she's been longing for. And so here's this religious woman by all accounts who has encountered Jesus at the well stuck in a life of sin and Jesus still offers her grace. He still has a conversation with her. And when she asks about worship, he answers her because we have a desire to worship and ultimately God wants us to worship him, right? In spirit mm -hmm. and in truth. <laughs> like that's that's how that part of that passage goes. Um and so I just wanted if you're not worshiping God, then you're worshiping something else. And so for these women who say, well, I can't go to church on Sunday morning because I've you know, watched pornography. Well, then by not worshiping God, you are essentially choosing to worship pornography instead. Like, and so understanding that we have this desire to pour our affections on something and to give our time to things and to give our devotion to something. We're going to do it to something. We're, some moms worship their kids, you know, like, or they worship wives, worship their husbands. Like, but God wants us to worship him and he wants us to come to him. Even when we are struggling with sin, he's asking us to come to him. Um, 
and to meet us there in that place. Yeah. So the, the last desire we, that we probably got time to talk about is you talk about a desire for healing, that, that we have this desire for healing. Can you talk a little bit about that? And of course, how, how that applies to this journey as well. Yeah, I feel like that's, and you probably have experienced this in all of your years of ministry too. I feel like in a broader narrative, that is something that is often missing, right? We we talk about, well, just stop it. I was just thinking about that earlier today. You know, if someone comes to us and says, well, I'm struggling with pornography, so often the answer is, well, just stop. You know, <laughs> and you're like, I was trying to, like, I, and I can't, and I'm trying, and that's why I'm talking to you because I don't know how to get out of this. But we get so stuck on just stop it and this behavior modification. And we're going to, you know, throw down the passwords and the filters and we're going to get you to stop it. But if you are not getting down in there and healing the parts of your life that need to be healed, pornography does immense damage, but it also, you can be drawn into it by damage as well, right? So there can be damage caused by pornography and the damage that caused you to turn to it to begin with. And both of those are areas where you, we need Messiah to show up the way I, I, I show it or phrase it in the book. Um, because at the end of this conversation with Jesus and the woman at the well, she says, you know, someday Messiah is going to show up and he's going to make everything right. And Jesus says, I am. That's that's who I am. <laughs> I am Messiah. I'm who you're waiting for. And I think so many of us, when we turn to pornography for a coping mechanism to numb pain in our lives, or we start to rely on it to deal with emotions or to just distract ourselves from whatever is going on around us, to make sense of trauma, that can be a big one for women too. If they've experienced a sexual trauma, they'll start to watch videos and content that reflects that trauma as a way of trying to come to terms with what's happened to them. Um, And so we try to use pornography to to heal in a way, but it, it can't heal. It just does more damage. Jesus wants to heal. And until we let him in and until we allow him to heal Another group that I recorded with said it's like being a dry drunk. Like when you're in AA, you can start replacing, yeah, you're not turning to alcohol anymore, but now you're working out, you know, 20 times a week instead, or you're turning to something else. So until you're finding healing for those areas of your life that have been damaged by pornography or damaged before pornography, until you're finding mending in that you are going to continue to look for other ways. Yeah, you might get rid of the pornography because you got the right set of filters or you've just replaced it with something else. And for women, I see a lot of them replacing it with self-harm. Um, they go from watching pornography to just, okay, I give up on that. Now I'm just going to harm myself instead. Or they or binge eating is something that I've seen as well or disordered eating. Um, so that's not... I think as Christians, especially, we have to step away from it. It's not, we're not winning if all we're doing is making sure people aren't watching pornography. We need to be concerned for the heart and soul of people and the healing of people. We need to care about those hearts that Jesus died for, right? Like the, he wants us to have abundant lives full of freedom. And he says the enemy comes to, to steal and to kill, to steal and to kill and to destroy. And that means that Jesus did not come just so we would stop watching pornography. He came so that those things that have been stolen, killed, and destroyed could be restored and revived and reconciled. And so he wants healing for us. And so if we want to experience freedom, we have to be willing to step back and say, God, what part of my life needs healing for me to be able to walk away from this? Because it's not its not about me sitting down in front of the computer and willing myself out of watching pornography. I want a heart that doesn't even want to go there anymore. That's what I want. Right. And we have to be willing to say what healing has to happen for me to get there. And that's why I love the, the title of your book, Quenched. It's that there can actually be true fulfillment and satisfaction that we find in Christ and in the satisfaction he wants to bring in 
uh, satisfying that thirst and that hunger that we have. So as we wrap up here, Jessica, what what just final word of encouragement would you have for those women that are listening that are struggling with hope? And then where can ladies find more information about you and your book? Yeah, so I think one of the things I've tried to, to share all the time is that um, whatever you are, if you're facing a hardship, um, whether you're single and feel like you're struggling to to get married, or if your marriage is having difficulties, or um, I've had married women come to me and struggling with infertility, saying this is God's way of punishing me for what I've done. I just I want to speak against that right now because that's not who our God is, and our God is a God of grace and of of restoration and of good gifts. So He. I just, I want, I wish women could walk away from that narrative of like, man, because I'm not getting these things I'm desiring, God is punishing me and he's never going to let me have what I want. I felt like that. I felt like that back when I wrote Beggar's Daughter. And now I have an amazing husband and two beautiful little girls and we have a, a very healthy and thriving marriage. And so whatever you think is impossible is not impossible with grace. And mm. so I I just want to encourage women especially in that cuz I think that there can be like shame holdovers where it's like, well yeah, God set me free. Yeah, sure, he I've got a a husband now, but our marriage is rocky and that's all my fault. Like be willing to work through that those areas that still need healing, um especially when it comes to the voice of God and how he's communicating with you. Um and then, yeah, I, my website's beggarsdaughter.com. There's a study guide for Quenched on there as well as some other resources, some free and some are connections to other groups um, that are specifically mm-hmm. for women because I I believe in networking and there are a rising number of voices in the field. And I'm so excited because mm-hmm. I'm getting old and not going to be cool anymore. And uh, <laughs> so I'm excited to see some younger ladies who have kind of taken up the mantle and are starting to share their stories and create resources. And so those are all linked there as well. Yeah. We'll be sure to put that in the show notes and and I'm going to encourage everybody to go get a copy of Jessica's book. Um, but thank you so much, Jessica, for continuing to do this work and for being part of just this really great conversation today. Thank you. Yeah. And listeners, um, I am so glad that you've been with us. We love to help you take your next best step on your journey. Um, And so if you want to reach out to us, we'd love to help get you connected with Jessica and her stuff and just whatever resource you need. uh, We want to help you get connected to that. So please reach out to us and we look forward to seeing you back here again next time on the Pure Sex Radio program. Take care. (laughs) 